Welcome everybody to Our American Government. I am your host, Mr. Samuelson, and today we are looking at interest groups. This is a part of our look at the legislative branch of government. So what are interest groups? Well, interest groups are groups of people who share common goals or interests and seek to influence government, um, shaping policy to benefit their interests. Now, interest groups have existed longer than our Constitution. These are not new things. People have been trying to influence government since before there was a U.S. Constitution, before there was a firmly established U.S. government. This is not a new thing. But the Constitution took this in mind, and they wanted to create a system that did two things. One, made sure that all people have a voice, including interests. People have the right to petition their government. But we also wanted to make sure that interest groups did not themselves become too powerful and take over the government. So we've been trying to strike this balance, and we are still trying to strike this balance today. Interest groups can be very powerful. And they believe that this power comes in numbers. So an interest group really designs its works, its effort around building um, a collective voice by getting numbers of people together. Because if you've got one person shouting, that's one thing. If you've got a million people shouting, that's a lot harder to ignore. There's power in numbers. So groups use their resources, their money, their connections, um, to recruit new members and to shift public opinion towards supporting their point of view on one issue or potentially a number of issues. So how are they led? Well, interest groups can be led by a passionate citizen. This happens. It's just a person like you or me, we get an idea, things should be done differently. We start talking about it, we gather support, there's interest, there's momentum, and we change policy. More often, interest groups are led by business leaders, or sometimes they actually hire professionals to come in to shape a message and to drive public policy. Now, the success of an interest group does cost a lot of money. There is a lot of money that needs to be spent, sometimes in advertising to shift public opinion, and a lot of times in finding candidates that support your issue. And rather than try to change one person's mind, find somebody else whose mind is already set and dump money into their political campaign to get them elected. Interest groups do both. Now, groups, because it is so expensive to have a successful interest group campaign, um, it tends to be the ones that have the most money that are the most successful, which is why interest groups that serve wealthy populations usually find it more successful. And we wind up with a government that tilts a little bit toward the needs of the wealthy. So what types of interest groups are there? There are business interest groups, and they look out for the specific interests of a business or a group of businesses. They may seek to lower corporate taxes, bring down their tax rate, or to decrease regulations, the rules that they have to follow. If there are fewer rules they have to follow, they can produce um, their goods at lower costs and increase their profits. An example of a business interest group is the National Association of Manufacturers. So it's not just one company that manufactures goods. A group of them have come together, several voices being louder than one, and they push for their interests. Uh, labor groups also do the same. It's not just business, also labor. Um, and labor groups seek to protect workers. They may want to put in better workplace safety regulations. These regulations that the business group wants to get rid of, the labor groups may want to add, right? A safer workplace is more expensive to manage. If we can cut corners on some of the safety um, and reduce costs there, more profits for the business. But of course, workers may lose a few more fingers each year. So there's a, a balance and negotiation conflicting interests that go there. All right, agriculture groups. Um, an agriculture interest group is one that looks at the interests of farmers. Now we can be talking about small farmers and we can be talking about mega agricultural corporations like um, Purdue Chicken that 
just moves like half the chickens in the country. Um, either one can be represented by an interest group. Um, these groups, such as the Grange and National Farmers Union, um, they might want to shape trade policies, okay? Increase how much uh, milk we're exporting to other countries um, so that they can sell more goods. Um, example there is going on with UK right now. We want to export more milk to the UK, so we're advocating for the UK to drop their standards on milk. Uh, there's more pus in American milk than there is in milk in the UK. The UK, they have regulations in place to limit the amount of pus that's allowed to pass from the cow into the milk into what we consume. In the US, we have much lower regulations. There's a lot more pus in our milk. So an interest group may push to find ways around these regulations to increase the export of American milk without increasing our health regulations. Uh, they, yeah, may want to decrease regulations which increase their costs. It's kind of what I just went over. All right, other interest groups. Uh, professional associations can organize as an interest group that look after professionals in a particular field. Uh, the American Medical Association is an interest group that looks after doctors. The NEA, the National Educational Association, um, looks after teachers and their interests. We also have environmental interest groups that are concerned with environmental issues, pollution, um, toxic levels of whatever in our environment, uh, or conservation, saving natural lands and protecting endangered species. We can also have public interest groups that represent a wide range of concerns like public safety, police, fire, etc. cetera. Um, there are thousands of interest groups in this country, and we've just talked about a half dozen here. So how do they get this work done? Well, they have to have connections with government, and this is where lobbyists come in. Lobbyists are members of an interest group which build relationships with politicians. It is the politicians who design policy. It's the lobbyists who speak on behalf of the interest group to the politician. Now, a lobbyist's job then is to persuade a politician to pass certain regulation. And sometimes the lobbyist will even say, hey, here's a bill that we wrote. Introduce this. Try to make this a law. Lobbyists will do that because interest groups will write laws that benefit their own group. The lobbyist can't introduce it in the House, but a politician can. Now, what does a politician get in return? Well, politicians get an interest group that might raise money for them to help them run for re-election. This is why a lot of people don't like lobbyists. And because of this outsized interest of uh, power of lobbyists on law, there have been many attempts to um, limit their power, such as uh, lobbyists I can't remember exactly when, but sometime within the last 20 years, um, we're banned from being on the floor of the House and Senate, okay? Small step there. They can't actually go onto the floor of the House and Senate and do their lobbying there. But of course they can do their lobbying outside. Uh, this has led to a number of jokes about you know, bribery, right? If the interest group gives a politician money, it's illegal, but if they give it to the lobbyists and the lobbyists pass it on, eh, it's just lobbying. Or the idea that, you know, <laughs> politicians should wear the logos of the people who give them money so that we know who's really writing these laws. These are jokes, but with a touch of truth to them. Our last conversation for today is on PACs and super PACs. A PAC is a political action committee. This is like an interest group that raises money for a, a particular law or a particular candidate, more often a candidate for office. It's like their interest is a person that they want to get elected or a specific law that they want to get passed. Um, and that's what they focus around and that's what they specifically raise money for. PACs raise money to get a, a candidate elected. Now these PACs can coordinate directly with a politician, but because they're working with the politician, there are limits to how much money they're allowed to give them. Um, I can't remember the exact limit. I think it said it like $5,000 per candidate. 
So in the scale of uh, elections that cost millions, a PAC's direct contribution to a specific candidate is somewhat limited. But the Citizens United Supreme Court case uh, 10 years ago changed a lot of this. Now we have something called super PACs. Uh, according to Citizens United, uh, unaffiliated citizens, private individuals, can give as much money as they want. So PACs are tied to the candidate, but a super PAC isn't. A super PAC says, oh, no, there's no specific candidate that we're working for. We're just raising money in general. We're just a group of private citizens organizing our money to affect policy. So super PACs can give unlimited campaign donations to candidates of their choosing, which has led to a lot of loophole, you know, shady activities. Like somebody who works for a campaign for a political uh, candidate leaves the campaign to start a super PAC. This happens all the time. There's obviously a connection there. They're no longer allowed to talk, but they did all their coordinating, all their talking before that person left and formed the super PAC. Super PACs have a lot of um, people who dislike them on both sides of the uh, political aisle because of this sort of non-coordination coordination that is very common. All right, that is it for today for our interest groups. I hope you learned a thing or two, um, and I will see you next time. Farewell.